remercier Jocelyn et à l'équipe pour l'invitation aujourd'hui. C'est un grand plaisir de retourner à Québec et de vous présenter sur les musées. So I hope I'm going to present to you on the museum as a vehicle for historical consciousness. I can speak about this, of course, but I'd much rather you see the pictures. So hopefully this will work. I made the mistake of using a new software, new presentation software, which was not loaded on their machine. So I'm using my own computer, which obviously is not speaking to the, uh, the screen. But I'm going to start by talking about, um, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about, and hopefully the technician will arrive in time for me to whiz through the, the images. I'm a historian by training. I uh, undertook my PhD at Carleton, and it gave a structure, a form, to my natural inclination. And my natural inclination to think historically, I will say, to be a historian, came, I think, from growing up in museums. I began at the Royal Ontario Museum at the age of 12 as a member of the Saturday Morning Club, and many of us in the world in Ontario who continue to work in museums were, in fact, part of that Saturday Morning Club. At the Royal Ontario Museum, I was confronted by this wealth of objects, this wealth of exhibition. And this, don't forget, is quite a long time ago, so it wasn't quite as mediated technologically nor as um, uh, designed as, as it is today. But, and if you can't, um, hopefully we'll be able to show it to you, there was a model of the Parthenon, which intrigued me as a child this notion of the Parthenon. There were Chinese ceramics, and I will show you a bowl, a, a Jinware bowl, which I spent a lot of time looking at. And there was a Viking sword, which was in the uh, armor court there. And it, uh, who, who has been to the Royal Ontario Museum? Do the, uh, the Ontario people? Yeah, some people remember these. There was a famous armor court. And uh, je sais pas pourquoi ça fonctionne pas. Somebody. OK, bon, merci. C'est juste que j'ai changé. La seule chose que j'ai fait, c'est juste... Okay. Et avant, ça ne fonctionne pas fait. C'est pas fait. Et maintenant, ça ne fonctionne plus. Je ne sais pas pourquoi. Ça, c'est prési. Moi, je peux... OK, juste mettre ça. Et puis... OK, bon. He's going to uh, look at it, and we're not quite sure why it's not working, but we'll see. Oui, c'est peut-être. I might have to start again, eh? Mm -hmm. OK, bon, ça prend du temps. OK, shut down. OK, restart. OK, bon, on va redémarrer. Um, so this Viking sword that I saw, I was thinking of King Arthur, and there was this actual sword. It was nothing like my dreams, but still, it was part of my consciousness. So I want to then look at historical thinking as defined by the Benchmarks Project. And I want to ask, can museums, in fact, encourage the kind of historical thinking that Peter Satius and his group has been looking at? We know from the, uh, from the literature, and it's wonderful to sit here, actually, and listen and see these reports that, for many people, the museums are the most trustworthy sources when looking at the past. Um, that is a really important thing for people who work in museums. We've always been convinced that they're incredible resources. But why? Are they that way? Well, I think partly it's the institution itself and its own inner logic. It's partly what people do in the museum. And it's partly what most museums hold, which is material culture. Yes. It will take me, I have to break in a minute to put it back up. So just patience. But it's OK, because I haven't gotten very far in my slides yet. So I want to talk to you about um, these things. I want to talk about visiting the museum, about the buildings of the museum, about the way people interact within museums. And then I want to talk about material culture. And it's wonderful what um, Michel said about the uh, force émotive des objets, the emotional power of objects. And we talked a bit about emotion yesterday as well. And I want to talk a bit about that emotion and how it's used within the museum and how I think it can be used, that power of the object, the power of the museum experience, to look at uh, historical consciousness. So with a little luck, this will take a few minutes, I'll continue on a bit to talk about that. Um, so in, I want to talk about visiting the museum. And Michelle has given you a wonderful aperçu of the museums of Quebec. And the number 12 million visits to the museums in Quebec in a population of 7 million, that's extraordinary. 
And so museums are well used. And in fact, they're used by 50% of the population, more or less. In other words, every year, about 50% of the population will report. They have visited a museum, a historic site, and interpretations, and have gone to one of these kind of institutions. And we've seen that in some of your studies. Excuse me. Ah, oh, now you're going to see all my secrets, too. <laughs> And you'll see my incredibly messy desktop. It's like my office. It's coming. Um, so that's, that's really exciting, that half of Canadians and half, it looks like, half of North Americans and I think probably half of Australians will visit a museum, even more people in Finland. And they don't go alone. Um, people, when they go to museums, go in a group. The, the most common group is two, a group of two. So you go with a friend, you go with your son or daughter, or you go in a family group, you go with friends and family. That's very important. The communal nature of museum visiting is something which also relates to the notion of dialogue. The dialogue is not just between the museum and the visitor, but between visitors themselves about what they see. And you know, I told you it's messy. Um, and it's, it's still going to take a minute, but it will get there. Um, that's okay, we don't care about that. Okay, I think I can open, excuse me. This is when I need a technician working for me. Yeah. Okay. We're there. That's not me. <laughs> Let's just hope this opens up now. Come on. Yes. Thank you. Okay, whew. Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to whiz through the first slides. Uh, that's the Jinware bowl, that's the Viking sword, that's about historical thinking. Here we are at museums, material culture, we'll come back to that. Visiting the museum, it's about experience. It's fast, eh? 50% go, and they don't go alone, so here we are. Okay, um, they don't go alone, they go with others. And this is a really important finding, okay? It's a very important finding, and museums understand this. Not only do they not go with others, but the museum visit is often for somebody else or led by someone else. And so there's been a lot of work to say that sometimes it's the mother who makes the decision on what to look at, sometimes the father, sometimes it's the, and often it's the child. What do I want to look at? And that's a very, very important thing because we, when we design museums, we don't necessarily think of them as books or as movies or as pieces of music. They're not linear. And one of the reasons why is... Uh, oh, okay, the building itself... Okay, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that. But we, the other thing is when you go to a museum, you go to a very special place. And that's the other thing, that's, you already are in a frame of mind when you go to the museum. You are there to learn, you're there to enjoy. Uh, Michelle talked about that. But you go to a very special place. Museums are among some of the most unique architecture in the world. This is the Australian National Museum in Canberra, which I think is wonderful. And this is the Garden of Australia. And this is Cape Ronde in Paris. These are amazing buildings. They're buildings that make a mark in the urban context and the, um, in the social context. You've arrived in somewhere special, but when you get there, you do this. I mentioned you visit with friends, you are taken there by your children, by uh, one of your companions. This is a random walk. We take random walks in museums. Our attention is drawn by different things. We move around, and this leads to a very interesting phenomenon. And it's the phenomenon that Sharon uh, MacDonald refers to. Um, museums have always had, to varying extents, a good deal of serendipity, the fuzzy logic that means there will be in, uh, objects in the collections that can be represented 
into different kinds of connected displays. So I see this, I see that. I represent them myself. So the dialogue is also with the space of the museum. It's your representation to yourself of what's in the museum. It may go completely against the intention of the curator, of the exhibition designer. And it's, this is a constant evolution within the museum itself. And I think that's what makes them very important places of experience. Of course, museum uh, curators, designers, researchers, we want you to experience certain kinds of things, so we create exhibitions, which are the particular medium of the museum. And these are really devices or machines for communications and learning, and they have a great deal of power. They are whole body experiences. Not only are you in a random walk in the museum, but the exhibitions themselves can engage you completely. Now, this is a science center, but I've seen history centers do this. And think of going to a historic site. It's a whole body experience. It's sensory. So this kind of engagement of the whole body is very important. They can also be immersive. And I think the immersive experience, um, the same kind of experience we get when we go into special places in the world, whether in a national park or into certain very into great cathedrals, um, historic sites, museums recreate them, and this is a particularly interesting one, it's called the Big Picture Show, and this is at the Imperial War Museum North in Manchester. This is a huge room that you go and sit in, and these giant images are projected all around you, and they tell different stories. You can, there's about six or seven different stories that are told there. So a very, very powerful sound and light show within the museum, telling you in this case about um, submarines. They're also interactive. Um, this is a wonderful example, and I apologize for the image, but uh, the People's Museum in Manchester, I was obviously in Manchester recently, but the People's Museum in Manchester, this is an exhibition of banners by a man called Ed Hall. And I'm not going to click on this link because I didn't set it up now, but if you go to the link and you look at Manchester and you see what's happening in the exhibition, not only can you see an exhibition of the banners, you can leave your opinion about them in their audio boo, which they have, in which you can boo or yay, um, this little audio interface. They are suggesting you come back to hear a talk. You can, have, um, you can go and sit with one of the museum. Um, there's an acting company that will act out things. You can come back for a, um, a special uh, presentation. You can watch a movie. And you can even buy reproductions in the gift shop and mail postcards of the banner. So there's a lot of interaction. It's not just a going and looking. It's a going and doing. And you can go to workshop and create banners. So the Manchester Museum is very much, the People's Museum in Manchester, is about this notion of active engagement. They're also effective. And I simply have to put this image in. It's not very clear. But I do think it is about this power of emotion. And museums, there's been a fair bit of research done on how you learn in museums by museum people. And the Swedes, for example, have done a fair bit on what is the, what is the actual learning that goes on in the museum. It is not didactic. We may try to create didactic exhibitions. But museums are not particularly good at teaching people about dates or names, but they are very good, and this is something the Swedes have um, looked at, about evoking emotions and affecting values. So this is affective learning. How do I feel? What do I think? How have, how have my thoughts changed? And I want to go and I'll be showing you some examples of that by what I saw. So this emotional affect affects my behavior as well, affects the way I think about the world. Material culture. Material culture is culture made material. And then I love this phrase. It is inner wit at work in the world. Well, who said that? It's one of my favorite scholars. It's another scholar from Indianapolis. And this time it's Henry Glassy. Henry Glassy is a folklorist. He's the author of a book called Material Culture. Um, his first book was Folk Housing in Middle Virginia. It's a very unexciting title, but it is about understanding the aesthetics of 17th century settlers in Virginia by looking at the disposition of post holes in the ground. He's a historical archaeologist by training. He's also written about the potter's art, and he is very interested in artifacts. Artifacts set the mind in the body, the body in the world. They are physical things. They exist outside us, but they represent our thinking, our wit in the world. 
And this is exactly why they work so well in museums, I think. They are the physicality of the object and the physical experience of the space of the museum. The history of most people, he says, preserved in unwritten artifacts, escapes into oblivion. And I want to just point out this pot. Um, I think, hist as historians, we often rely on text. And I'm going to show you a bit more about that later. But for some people, they no longer have left us text to read. The only texts we have are, in fact, the texts of the objects. I was in the Ashmolean, and I did a random walk. I ended up in the basement looking, I think, for the washroom and came across a very, the Ashmolean's been all renovated, but there's a kind of corridor in which they've got some old cases. And in it was, this is from the Field Museum, but a very similar piece. These are carved stone vessels. They're pre-dynastic -dynast Egypt. They're 7,000 years old. And they are extraordinary for their modernity. I was just blown away by them. I'd never seen these things before. They're from Nubia. I was just, uh, this is only one I could find on the web. These are extraordinary objects, and they hit me with this kind of contemporary feel. And that's the, the random walk, but also the power of this object which speaks to the culture of a people who could work stone, this is diorite, who could work stone into this. So the technology of this people and their aesthetic sense was, I think, quite overwhelming. He also, Glass, he talks about the importance of art. So history is not just about things, the objects we make with our hands and use in everyday life. It's also about our greatest objects. So he suggests it would be polite to encounter each culture by its particular excellence. Let us say the particular ex material culture of excellence is art. And culture's most radiant, integrated expression of its values. So I want to just show you a very famous painting that I have worked on. This is a painting by Antonella de Messina. It's of St. Jerome and his study. Of course, St. Jerome is the translator of the Bible, so it's about words. But when you look at this painting for a while, and you think about the greatest expression, this is a wonderful panel painting, it's in the National Gallery in London. Why are there two birds at the bottom? I'm encountering this painting and I'm trying to understand it. And there's lots written about the Renaissance and Antella de Messina was a literate man. There's a lot written about St. Jerome and there's a lot written about painting at this period, but why are there, there two birds there? Well, those two birds, and I'm not going to tell you actually, I can tell you later, but they are part of the consciousness of the Renaissance artist, the Antonella, who did this work, part of his way of thinking about the world. It is a very different way than the way we think about the world. So the birds are there not just as decoration, they are very much part of the work. So by approaching this, this object as material culture, this painting, we can learn about the history of the Renaissance and the history of thought in the Renaissance. It's interesting, we don't have to just look at art, we don't have to look at old objects. Um, Sherry Turkle, who some of you may know, writes about objects like iPhones and the incredible attachment people have to their technologies. And if you have um, teenagers or you watch young students, you'll find that they're, the kind of conversations that go on about the kind of phone they're buying and their use of it and their attachment to it and their inability to live without it goes beyond simple mere possession. And what she talks about in Falling for Science is how some people fall in love with objects and it changes their lives. And finally, with material culture, one thing that's very important is the idea of taxonomy and classification. So here are butterflies, and this is an assemblage, and I'm going to talk to you a bit more about the assemblage. So Blasi also thinks about history, and he says things that are very well known to historians. Historians are, are uh, one who composes stories that function as social, social charters. History is a simultaneity of the historical, the non-historical, the changing, and the stable. So I want now to look at the seven principles. There are seven. Yes, yeah, seven, three, six. Sorry, Whew. six principles of historical consciousness that um, are, have uh, come out from the Benchmarks Project and look at them in the context of material culture, museums, and exhibitions. So historical significance. This is a catalog from an exhibition that was at the, national, the Japanese National Museum in Vancouver recently. It's Monogatari, which is Japanese for tales. So this is Tales of Powell Street. And in historical significance, we look at a historical person or event can acquire significance if we, the historians, link it to larger trends and stories that reveal something important. So these are oral histories, a bit of what um, uh, our, our Australian colleagues were talking about, the notion of the oral history, and linking it, taking these monogatari, these stories, placing them on display. And this is something the museums do. We make these stories public. 
And we did this in Montreal for um, Chinese Montrealers, and this is the comment that one woman wrote in the, in the uh, comment book. Thank you for documenting the history of Chinese Montrealers. Perhaps these stories get lost among all the other Quebec pasts. I have four generations of Chinese Montrealers in my family, and I'm so glad we become a part of public memory. I find that terrifying, that the museum has the ability to make public memory, but also great in a way that it's coming out there. But that's a terrible kind of responsibility. But I think for many people visiting the museum, and the people who came to this museum came to see the photographs of their family and friends, this sense of being part of history finally, because the museum put them on display, that's a strange but um, compelling phenomenon. Continuity and change. Um, this is something I think a lot of historians um, think about, a lot, at least I do. So this is an Etruscan mirror, and it's similar to the mirror that's in the Royal Ontario Museum I saw when I was about 13, except it was un flipped over and polished. And the Etruscans are a mysterious people. But looking into this polished mirror, I had a sudden sense of connection with the past in a very profound way, because, of course, mirrors, hand mirrors held like this, are something we all use. And as a 13 or 14 year old, all I could think about was how did she put her eye makeup on? The mirror image isn't very good. So this notion of change, continuity, technology, all these things can come out through uh, looking at uh, museum objects. We don't often do that with them, by the way, but we can. So one of the keys is to look for the change where common sense suggests there's been none, and looking for continuities where we assume there was change. It must have been really different in the Etruscan era. And yet, women looked at themselves in hand mirrors. So what am I, where can I take that? Historical perspective. In the benchmarks, it says the past is a foreign country. Um, I think that one of the things that museums can help do through the power of exhibitions is in fact to take people back. This is again one of those immersive experiences at the War Museum in Manchester, and this is on children in war. And so you sit there, it's about six or seven minutes long, you're surrounded by the voices, images of children, their experience of World War II, and this is one of the visitor comments. I was moved to tears when I saw the show, past generations spoke to me. So the ev evocation of historical empathy, which is part of perspectives, I think is something that can be done through this juxtaposition of image, of testimony, and immersive experience. But it can also be done through simple exhibitions of material culture, of objects. And one of the most amazing exhibitions I ever saw was at, in the 1980s. It was at the Royal Ontario Museum, and it was an exhibition from the Smithsonian called Precious Legacy. I could not find any images of it. But you have to imagine three huge exhibition rooms full of showcases, very traditional exhibition, full of objects. And these objects are the objects of Jewish culture, European Jewish culture. So there are wonderful Torah covers, there are beautiful textiles, there are wall paintings and plaques. I am amazed. I've never seen this kind of stuff. It's, it's this revelation. And you go around the corner at the end of the exhibition, and there are several drawings like this. And the sign on the wall in the little room is, and this is all that is left. And of course, these are the drawings from Turitsyn, from the, from the ghetto, from the ghetto in Prague. And this is all that's left of the children who are in Turitsyn. And that, I, I still get shivers when I think about it, because it completely blew me. I had no idea what I was going in to look at. So seeing this incredibly wealth of culture, this material culture which spoke of a rich, exciting, um, historic society, and this is all that is left. So the power, that power was, for me, I, I've never forgotten it, and I have never, as a result, I now know something about what happened in the past in a very visceral way that I can continue to go back to as I um, uh, learn it um, more. Finding primary sources of evidence, and uh, this is really important because um, in, in the benchmark side it says, the litter of history, which I love, letters, documents, records, diaries, drawings, newspaper accounts, other bits and pieces left behind on the beaches, I think, by those who have passed on are treasures to the historian. Well, not just letters and documents. 
this is an object, and I think learning how, we talked a little bit about visual literacy yesterday, so learning how to read objects is an important skill, particularly for societies who do not share our same uh, compulsion around keeping uh, literary materials. This is a uh, calabash from Mali. It was in an exhibition actually at the Musée de la Civilisation a number of years ago. It's from Cape Branly. And this is um, an exhibition of uh, objets blessés, wounded objects. And what it shows is how this calabash has been repaired. So it tells me a lot. It tells me about technology. It tells me about decoration. It tells me about value. It tells me about skill. There's a huge amount of information in this object. Here's a close-up. This was one of the most extraordinary exhibitions I ever saw because it also talked about reuse and about both the poverty and the richness of the culture. Another way, just in thinking about objects, this is um, an exhibition by Fred Wilson, and this case is called Metalwork, 1723 to 1880. It was shown at the Maryland Historical Society in Baltimore in 1992, and it revolutionized the way museums thought about their objects. You can see the metalwork, but there's a very unusual piece of metalwork in the front. So this is Baltimore, slave owning society. These are the wonderful pieces of repoussé silver in the uh, dining room, and in front of them are the shackles of the slave. So when Fred Wilson did this, he took material culture and he said, okay, metalwork, let's talk about metalwork. There it is. The metalwork was used for, it can be used in a number of different ways. So a primary source for history, um, Objects have, speak very loudly. Cause and consequence. Um, we need to consider human agency. People shaping, promoting, resisting change. Who are these people? Well, these people are concentration camp guards. And they're on holiday. And they're having a good time. And... Uh, what made them take on the work they did? Why did they not resist the work they did? What happened? Well, objects can help us. This is an image of, from 1933 from a German magazine, and it is about playing at concentration camp guard. These are children playing at how to be a concentration camp guard. Why would they do that? Because in school, they got to read the poison toadstool with pictures like this. They got to learn about how people, are meant, uh, people who are mentally ill took up space when it could be devoted to German workers' homes. So the genetically ill are a burden for the people. They got to have children's books like this one, where you know who your friends are. Like your father and your mother, the Fuhrer is an important part of your life. When they were in high school, they got a catechism of what it means to be German or Nazi. Oops, sorry. Let's make sure I'm in the right place. And when they were older, too, they got to read about the bombing of Coventry and the brave German soldiers who took revenge for the bombing of Germany. This is an assemblage of materials, things that are often shown together in museums. And these assemblages can have powerful effects. They allow us to see why did people make decisions? It's not simple, it's complex. These are complex decisions, and it helps us to understand um, that power. And this is probably the most famous assemblage in museums today. These are the shoes in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, and everybody talks about these if you see these. It's an assemblage. It's, it's an emotional impact by bringing things together, by bringing in multiples, these things have emotional impact, and they can make change. I'm going to uh, talk now and end with the uh, ethical dimensions. And if the story is meaningful, then there's an ethical judgment involved. And some of what we've been looking at is obviously ethical judgment. But this is, a, again, it was the Musée de la Civilisation, another exhibition from Kay Brown Lee called Ideki. And it was a series of portraits of Berber women from Algeria. And I'd like you to remember the look on this woman's face. It was an exhibition which combined the photographs with the pots created by these women, so a very powerful exhibition. <coughs> but the photographs were taken by a French photographer, and he realized he was a photographer, he had to go in, they, there were no identity cards, he had to create identity cards for these people. 
So he went in and he had to take these pictures. He ended up taking 200 a day. But he said it was the, image, the, the faces of the women that impressed him because they didn't have a choice. They were, they, had, they were obliged to unveil themselves and to be photographed. And he received their, their regard um, as a, it was a witness of their mute protestation. They had been violated. It was like a rape. And this is, this, the, so the, this exhibition combined the words of the photographer with the, these women plus the work of their hands for a very powerful statement about the regard for individuals. This was from an exhibition at the McCord that I mentioned before, Chinese um, photographs of Chinese Montrealers, and this I think has got to be an archetypal Canadian photograph. Um, these were all uh, donated by uh, the Chinese community. There were a series of four photographers who made albums. We used the, we work with the families, and this is one of the photographs. This was another. And this is, again, iconic on Mount Royal. Everybody goes up there, has their photo taken in front of the uh, view of the city and behind. But what was very interesting, again, with the comments, um, I was really amazed, again, about effect. A lot of Asian people came to see this exhibition. We noticed a real increase in the museum because we had the banners outside showing Asian people. We postulated, we weren't sure. But what was interesting is the tourists who came from Japan and some Koreans, so these are actual verbatim transcriptions, um, by showing these very innocent images of Chinese Montrealers going about their daily life in Montreal, doing whatever, this was not a show which actually was about um, terrible things done to Chinese Canadians, it was simply about their lives. What was very interesting for me was um, the impact of that exhibition on the Japanese and Korean visitors, I learned about these people. I learned they were like me. It had amazing effect on changing their values. Did they go back to their communities and did they live these changes? We don't know. But they were certainly impressed by this just collection of photographs of daily life. So I think that to end, just something that I think is really important, again, is this power of art, the power of the object, and the power of that lived experience within the museum. And something that I find that I've been looking at recently is the embodiment of empathy. And we talked a bit yesterday about reenacting the past with 9-11, but this embodiment of experience, and this is Maya Lin's Vietnam Wall, in which you have to look by date, it's not alphabetical, you have to run through the list of all those who died and find the name of the person you know who died or remember their date, and see who died around them on the same day. This reenactment, in this case through an object of art, is something that I think museums, historic sites, and monuments can bring, and they have an important role to play then in histor historical thinking. I don't think we use them well enough. I don't think we've thought hard enough. I think we haven't brought the principle of historical consciousness overtly into our exhibitions. But I think just by, I hope by seeing some of these examples that there's a real opportunity for us to start to meld better the work of the academic, the work of teaching, with the incredible emotional power of museums and the force um, emotive des objets to really create a new venue for making change, for making affective uh, learning possible, and for increasing historical consciousness. Thank you.